Welcome to the online worship service of Triumph Lutheran Brethren Church. Triumph is a multi-site church in the Midwest with campuses in Moorhead, Minnesota and West Fargo, North Dakota. Our vision is to see the life and message of Jesus transform hearts, homes, and cities. We're grateful that you've joined us online as the Lord works through our ministry both locally and around the world. Wherever you are at, our prayer is that God would meet you and that the life and message of Jesus would transform your life. In my wrestling and in my doubts, in my failures you won't walk out. Your great love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea. Oh, you are the peace in my troubled sea. In the silence, you won't let go. In the questions, your truth will hold. Safe to the shore. Safe to the shore. 
As we continue our series in Dwell, which is what we're calling our summer series as we've been preaching and teaching through God's word, we're encouraging you this summer to memorize God's word. Uh, if you want to hop onto our website at triumphlbc.org slash dwell, you can order a dwell pack that we've created. You can pick them up in the foyer at either of our campuses as well. But when we get this dwell pack, you'll find these cards. This happens to be the card for this week. Each of these cards have Bible memory options on the back. A shortened version, if you're kind of struggle with Bible memory or maybe a little bit younger and you just want to look at a short version and a longer extended version as well if you want to challenge yourself and memorize God's word. We really believe having it in your, in your heart, in your soul is, is valuable as the Holy Spirit uses that in your life. As we continue in our dwell series, we're going to be looking into 1 John today and we're going to be talking about sin. Now, no one wants to talk about sin. No one, no one wants to have the conversation around sin, especially if it's sin in our own lives. So there's a couple of things I want to do as we set this up to make sure we're all on the same page. And the first would be helping us understand what sin is. It's a church word that we use a lot. We talk about this a lot. And how do we understand it? Well, the, the scriptures give us many different descriptions and, and descriptors of what sin is to help us understand it. One would be missing the mark. Uh, think of archery, right? You, you, you've got the bullseye, you've got the very center of the target and you're launching an arrow at it. And if you miss the target or miss the bullseye, you missed the mark. One way we understand sin is that there is a mark we should hit and we miss it. Another is the idea of twisting, taking something that's good and pure and wonderful and, and twisting it so it's no longer pure and wonderful. So we take God's commands, we take God's word and we, and we twist it. The, the other is the idea of a stain or a blemish. You think of this beautiful white shirt and you get a big old ketchup stain right down the front from eating that hot dog, right? There's the, the shirt is now stained, it's, it's been wrecked. So sin is, is in many ways uh, described, but those are some of the ways to help us understand. It's, it's our missing the mark. It is, it is us twisting what God has given us. It's a, a stain or a blemish upon our lives. So the question we're asking today is what do we do with sin? What do we do with the sin in our lives? And I think to help us understand this and to, to process how we would handle our sin we have to understand or think about how serious we think sin is. Is sin a big deal? Is sin not a big deal? Because how we view our sin and, and whether we think it's a big deal or not indicates how we respond to it. So what I wanna do, I'm gonna give you a couple statements on, on, on either ends of spectrums, on a spectrum. And, and ask the question, where do you fall in this spectrum? So maybe on one end of the spectrum would be a statement that sounds something like this. Sin loses its power when we embrace the truth that every stumble is a chance to rise again, stronger and wiser than before. Right, so maybe on one end of the spectrum, sin is nothing more than a stumble along life's journey. And when we stumble, we rise again, stronger than we did than we were before, understanding things and learning from them and continuing on with the journey. Sin is simply a stumble. The other end of the spectrum might sound something like this. Sin is the gravest of matters for it offends an infinitely holy God and separates us from his perfect love and fellowship. Sin is a big deal. It's a huge deal because it offends God himself. We have a spectrum. How serious is sin? And then what do we do with our sin? Today, we're gonna to go again, like I said, into 1 John, and we're gonna see that the Apostle John provides us with four possible interactions with the sin that's in our lives. So if you have your Bibles, we're gonna be in 1 John chapter one. We'll begin at verse five. We're gonna spill over into the first couple of verses of chapter two. So here we go, 1 John one, beginning at verse five. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him, there is no darkness at all. 
If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have the advocate with the father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins and not only for ours, but for the sins of the whole world. What do we do with sin? John gives us four possible options. The first one would be to live in our sin. In verse six, he says this, if we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness. We claim one thing and yet live another. Let me tell you uh, the story of uh, Mike. Mike is a mid-level manager uh, who oversees a team of 11. He frequently talks about the importance of a really good work-life balance. And, and he encourages his, his staff to take breaks and just to maintain a healthy work environment. However, despite what Mike says, Mike is consistently assigning excessive workloads. And he expects his team to work long hours, even on the weekends, to hit unmanageable deadlines. He rarely grants time off. He denies vacation requests, and he certainly is not providing adequate support or resources to manage the workload that is coming. Mike is an example of saying one thing and doing another. Saying one thing and doing another. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness. Frequently, John will use this contrast between light and dark to help us understand uh, our relationship with God, help us understand who God is. And in fact, when you look into the scriptures, we, we see that God is light. Our text says that in verse five today, God is light. In him, there is no darkness at all. That God is the light. We see that he provides light. If you go back to Genesis chapter one, in the creation account, God says, let there be light. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. In Exodus, as the people are walking through the desert at nighttime, they don't have flashlights. They don't have the big floodlights. They don't have headlights. They don't know where they're going. And so God goes before them in a pillar of fire in order to light their way so they can see where they're going. He provides light. We also see that light exposes things. When light hits things that are hidden in the darkness, they are now seen. Often again in scriptures, we see this with sin. Sin that is done and the deeds that are done in the darkness are brought to light as light hits them. God is light. So what's the darkness? Well, it's all things that are opposed to God. It is the things that are opposite of that. It's our sin. It's the evil in the world. If we claim to be in the light, yet walk in the darkness, we are liars. See, we make the claim of one thing. Our mouth says one thing, but our actions say the other. We claim Jesus Christ, we claim to be followers, yet everything about our life is opposite of that, is contrary to the things of God. Our behaviors are our statements, and we live in them. Now, we should, we should be clear on something here. John is not talking about a struggle with sin. Right? He's not talking about the stumbles that we have as we're trying and living out a life motivated by the Spirit. That is covered in chapter two when he says that we, if we do sin, we have an advocate, Jesus. 
What John's talking about here is the deliberate choice, knowing which path we should take and choosing the darkness, knowing what God says and choosing the other way. One of the things that we can do with our sin is that we can continue to live in it. We can also deny that there is a problem in the first place. So the second thing would be showing up, a second way in which we can option, we can have as we interact with our sin shows up in verse eight. If we claim to be without sin. Now, I don't, I don't know how many of us would, would boldly declare that we do not have a sin problem, that this sin is not in us, especially in church, right? Like we have enough pride to say, I'm not gonna declare that publicly, but we may think it. And it may be a part of our lives. I don't have a sin problem. Here, here's one of the ways this shows up. I'm basically good. I might have a few struggles here and there, but I'm a good person. Now, growing up the way I did, like probably many of you, there was an intense emphasis placed on self-esteem, right? That I'm good and that I can do anything that I want to do and that, and that I'm wonderful and that I'm amazing. I still hear this out of people. They give themselves a the daily pep talk about how wonderful they are the daily pep talk of telling their kids how wonderful the kids are so they can step into the world and face the world. I'm a really good person. Now, don't get me wrong. I don't think there's anything wrong with self-esteem. Like, frankly, I wish I had more of it at times. But there's a difference between knowing who I am in Christ and thinking that I'm a really good person by default. What John is getting at in verse eight is this idea that there's no inward sin problem. Yet one of the things that the scriptures will show us over and over again is that inwardly we do have a sin problem. We have the missing the mark. We have the twisting. We have the stained blemish within us. Psalm 51 reminds us that it comes at the moment of conception that is a part of who we are. So that as I am acting out as an infant crying, as I am a toddler navigating the world of friendships and and siblings, that sin is just in me. And it's not just a kid thing. It's a you and me thing. If we're honest with ourselves, we have those moments when we're all alone, remember the last time that you were by yourself, all alone, no one could see you, no one could hear you, and certainly no one was reading your mind to know what your thoughts were. How many of us in that moment find ourselves drawn to goodness? to think well of other people, to do things that are wonderful and in line with God's word or how many of us feel the pull into darkness. No one's gonna see you anyway, go ahead and do it. No one can hear you so you can say it and no one's inside your thoughts, go ahead and think it. We have an inward problem. We are not mostly good with a little bit of struggle. We are evil all the way to inside of us. And the good that comes out is the grace of God. So we can deny that there is a problem. But when we do that, we're only deceiving ourselves. Right? You're not fooling anyone else. No one else is looking at you going, you are so amazing. You have no sin problem in your life. And you know how I know that? Because you don't think that about other people. You're, you're not looking at others around you and thinking to yourself, man, that person is really, really good. They have no struggles. They are amazing people. They are good people. We deny ourselves if we say that we have no sin problem. 
So we can continue to live in our sin. We can deny that there is a problem. We can deny the actions that we take. John says in, in verse 10, if we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and the word is not in us. Now, admittedly, it sounds like he's saying the same thing. He's just repeating himself for emphasis, right? If we, verse eight says, if we claim to be without sin, verse 10 says, if we claim we have not sinned, same thing, right? No, not quite. John is actually drawing a distinction here. In verse eight, what he's doing is he's, he's talking about the inward issue. In verse 10, he's talking about the outward actions that come from the inward issue. The I have not sinned. The actions that I took, the things that I said, the thoughts that I had were not sin. You know who's really good at this? Children. Children are amazing at this. Right, what, what, what kids have ability to do, you can, you can watch two children, right? So child A is next to child B and child A takes that hand and slaps child B right in front of your face. You look at child A and you say, what are you doing? Why did you slap your sister? To which child A responds, I didn't. What, what do you mean? I just saw you do it. No, I didn't. Yes, you just slapped. No, I didn't. I didn't slap my sister. I didn't do it. Right? They can deny it right to your face. Even though you saw it, you knew it happened. You watched it happen. And yet they deny that it even happened. By the way, adults are getting very good at this. Our culture is embracing this anymore. So much so that we have a word for this now. It's gaslighting. Creating a false reality that doesn't exist in order to protect yourself or to push an agenda. Right? Like we'll say things that just are categorically untrue. We'll deny that things even happen, even if it's on video. I didn't do it. The other way this happens, kids are really good at it too, is, is, is when something happens, let's say that child A, child B interaction happened further across the room. And you call out to child A saying, hey, what are you doing? And child A just completely ignores it, right? Because if I don't act as though I heard mom saying something, if I don't respond to dad, then I don't have to deal with it. Or if child A is really smart, what child A does is does the slap and as soon as the voice comes, child A leaves the room. And the hope is that if I ignore it long enough, if I leave and I don't come back, I don't have to deal with it and it's as if it never happened. I haven't sinned. I don't know what you're talking about. If we claim we have not sinned. One of the gifts of the Holy Spirit in our lives is the conviction of sin. It shows up in John chapter 16. And I mean it when I say it is a gift of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will come into our life and will remind us, will tell us that we're doing something wrong. The Holy Spirit will be the one that's saying, why are you slapping your sister? And yet I don't know about you and how you respond to the Holy Spirit's call in your life. But I often find myself telling the Holy Spirit, I didn't do it. Or maybe more often, completely ignoring the call of the Holy Spirit in my life. I didn't do it. And maybe a little bit of a variation to this idea it isn't so much that I'm going to flat out deny the action. But what I might deny is that the action that I did indeed take, the words that I did indeed say, well, they're not sinful. Yes, I did it, but it's not a big deal. And again, we'll go back to our kids for this one. Right, your, your child does something wrong. Your child is doing things that they are not supposed to do. You confront said child on that issue 
And this child says, well, Johnny was doing it. And that gives a parent a beautiful opportunity to take a line and to share a line with the child that has been passed on for generation and generation and generation. The line, as some of you know, well, if Johnny jumped off a cliff, would you jump off a cliff too? We look at kids and we think it's ridiculous. Just because Johnny's doing it doesn't mean it is the right thing to do, but you and I aren't all that different, are we? Well, Johnny's getting a divorce, so therefore I can too. Well, Johnny is living with his girlfriend, so I can too. Johnny has chosen to change his gender, so I can too. Johnny gossips at the office, so I can too. Johnny lies. Johnny fudges the paperwork. Johnny steals, so I can too. The idea is that if everybody else is doing it, or if we see it happening in our world, it can't be wrong. So when God confronts us with something, when the gift of the Holy Spirit comes to convict us of a part of our life, we may not deny that we did it, but we will say, God, it isn't that big of a deal. Everybody else is doing it. It's the way the world works today. I have not sinned. And we make him out to be a liar. God, you're lying to me right now. God, you're, you're, you're lying in saying that what I have done is a sin. God, you are lying to me if you're trying to tell me that I did that thing. God, you are a liar in this moment and you are lying to me. I have not sinned. So we can continue to live in it, claiming to be in the light, letting everyone believe that we are in the light, yet continuing to walk in the darkness. Oh, we can claim there is no problem. We can make the claim to say, I have not a sin problem. Look at me, I'm good. We can say and we can claim that we haven't actually sinned. So which one are you? Where do you see yourself? Are you the one who is continuing to walk in sin? Are you the one who thinks more highly of themselves than maybe they should? Are you the one who denies that what they do is sinful? Which one are you? Confession? I'm all three. I've got the trifecta. There are more times than I'd like to admit in my life that I know better, but choose the darkness anyway. There are way too many times in my life that I think how wonderful I am, especially when I compare myself to others. And way too many times that I find myself telling God that he's wrong and that I haven't sinned. Which one are you? I am grateful that John doesn't stop at three, but he adds a fourth. He adds a fourth. On the spectrum of the seriousness of sin that we started with, where do you fall? 
Do you see sin as a stumble along life's journey? Do you see sin as the gravest of all issues and matters because it offends God himself? Can I tell you that, that if you're uncomfortable with either of the first three options, living in it, denying the problem, claiming we never have sinned, if you're uncomfortable with your life and, and how those work, you, you probably lean towards understanding sin as a serious issue between you and God. And I want to tell you, we can never underestimate the seriousness of our sin because it cost Christ everything to purchase your forgiveness and your redemption. And if sin was no big deal, if sin was nothing more than a stumble along life's journey in which we get up and keep moving, if sin is not a big deal, then what a waste of a life of Jesus Christ. To come and to die for no reason. There is a fourth option, confession. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and he is just, and he'll forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. It's confession. But I must confess to you a confession is hard. It's hard for a couple of reasons. One is I don't want to admit that what I did was actually wrong. So confessing means that I did it and I'm declaring that I did it. I don't like doing that. But confession is also hard because I don't know how my confession will be received. Right? Kids will do something wrong and look at their brother and say, don't tell dad. Why? Because if we confess to dad, we think we know how dad's going to respond. Don't tell mom because we know how mom is going to respond. If I have offended you, if I've done something to harm you and I must come and confess it, I don't know how you're going to respond to me. Are you going to punch me in the face? and lay me out? Are, are you going to look at me and say, the relationship is over, you're going to cut me out, and we will no longer talk and no longer communicate, and the relationship is ruined? Are you going to hold this over my head for the next 15, 20, 25 years, reminding me of this moment, reminding me of what it is that I had done? How are you going to respond? Because if I don't know how you're going to respond, I am so much more hesitant to confess. Because I don't want to ruin the relationship. I don't want to get punched in the face. And I certainly don't want the guilt of the next 25 years of you bringing it up over and over again. So how does God respond to your confession? Is he a harsh judge in, in which the earth itself is going to open up and swallow you in? Is he going to send a lightning bolt from heaven and strike you dead? Is he going to kick you out of the family and say you have no place in heaven and you have no place in my family if that's true? Or are you going to walk with Jesus for the next 25 years and he's going to keep bringing it up over and over again. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. How will God respond to your confession? We know that he's just. He doesn't pretend like it never happened. He never looks at you and say, ah, it's no big deal. It is a big deal. It's a very big deal and it happened.
but Jesus took care of that. So God, the just judge, is able to give sin its due punishment because Jesus took the punishment. So we know that he's just and we know that he's faithful. Meaning every single time you confess to him, whether it's the first confession of that particular sin or the hundredth confession of that particular sin, he is faithful to forgive and to purify to forgive the missing of the mark, to forgive the twisting, to purify the stain. He's faithful and he is just and forgive and purify our sins. What do you do with sin? Do you continue to live in it? Do you deny the problem? Do you deny the actions? Or do you confess? I see myself in the first three. And I am eternally grateful for the fourth, which overrides all three. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and he is just to forgive us of our sins and to purify us from all unrighteousness. Let's pray. God, I confess to you that confession to you is so hard. God, I don't want to admit when I've done wrong. I, I don't want to admit and to acknowledge the things that you, Holy Spirit, are saying to me. I'd rather deny or continue to live in than confess. Holy Spirit, enable me to confess. Enable me to admit the things that you already know to be true about me so that I may receive the forgiveness and the purification that I so desperately need in my life. And God, I thank you. I thank you for Jesus that makes confession approachable and makes confession possible. Jesus, thank you for taking my punishment upon yourself. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, I'm Pastor Doug, and I want to take a minute and and say thank you for watching the worship service today. If you'd like to extend your time of worship, we have a couple links to worship songs that fit today's message in the description down below. Simply click and you can spend more time with Jesus in your day today. I have three quick thoughts that I wanted to share with you, and it'll only take a minute. First, we'd love to connect with you. If you'd be willing, you can visit our website at triumphlbc.org connect and let us know how we can reach you. Or you can visit triumphlbc.org events to find an activity that you could jump into. Second, we hope that you see this content as a supplement to your walk with Jesus. Our digital content really isn't designed to replace belonging and engaging with a gospel community. So whether that's here at Triumph or at another church, we invite you to find a community that you can connect with. And third, we invest a lot of resources into producing content that's used to bless people just like you all over our community. If this or any of the other resources we have here at Triumph have blessed you, would would you consider giving? It's because of your generosity that we are able to continue creating and serving online.